General Tiberius mobilizes his exhausted troops. Tiberius is sent along with eight legions and auxiliary armies to reinforce the Rhine frontier and Gaul. Fortunately, Rome appears safe for now. The Germans show no sign of hostility at the borders. But the Romans have learned how crafty the Germans can be, and so they stay vigilant, even at home. Guards are stationed throughout the city. And it was a severe blow to Rome as a city, as a society, to know that these peoples of the north, whom it had regarded through the writings of Caesar and Tacitus and others as being far inferior to Rome militarily, were able to deal this devastating blow. Mighty Rome, the apex of Western civilization, suddenly feels vulnerable. Every foreign citizen or visitor is now suspect, a potential terrorist. Augustus, fearing a sympathetic uprising among the Germans in Rome, expels them. While all of Rome quakes with fear, the Germans beyond the Rhine are jubilant. Arminius celebrates his victory over Rome by taking a bride, Thusnelda. She is the daughter of rival chieftain Segestes, who had tried to warn Verus of Arminius's treachery. Very much against her father's wishes, she allowed herself to be kidnapped by Arminius because German women were strong. They would kill their men if they were retreating from battle. They saw themselves as worthwhile. They wanted to be allied with the best possible man. Thusnelda, that was Arminius' wife's name, saw Arminius as the very best man among the Germans, and she wanted nothing less for herself. The victory against the Roman legions has earned Arminius tremendous clout. Now, as king of the Cheruscian people, he forms a coalition of tribal leaders. Arminius thought that this spectacular defeat would give him the purchase, the fame, to be what the Germans had never had, a king over everyone. The site of the massacre becomes a holy place, left untouched to commemorate the victory over the Romans and to please the Germanic gods that granted it. The Germans worshipped in groves, as far as we know. They kept images and, and various statues and animal totems in their forest. Um, and actually, uh, this idea of totemism appears to have been something fairly important uh, for the Romans, too, but more so, perhaps, for the Germans. And so, as Rome staggers, the Germans revel in their barbaric success, keeping the Roman weapons as a sacred reward. Things like swords and spearheads and shields took a lot of time and a lot of material to make. Uh, economically, they were very precious, but it does seem that in many of these circumstances, their ritual value was more important. And for that reason, uh, these were deposited sometimes by the thousands. And we even find weapons with ornamentation in silver and gold on them, indicating officer status. Through violence and cunning, the Germans have snatched their land back from the Roman intruders, at least for now. But Rome is not giving up. The Romans realized they had a big problem along the Rhine. And after they were able to regroup, which meant finding more soldiers, um, trying to build new alliances with the barbarians, they began after some time to send expeditions across the Rhine, uh, both to try to pacify the area, but also to regain their lost honor because the defeat of Varus had been so disgraceful. And so for posterity and for the empire's self-esteem, Rome must somehow turn this dire situation around. 13 AD, four years after the massacre, Emperor Augustus sends the aptly named General Germanicus and his troops to engage Arminius and the Cherusci barbarians. 
It takes a long time to restore a strike force so that Germanicus has troops to deal with this problem. There was no question it had to be done, or the whole idea of the emperor's honor, and perhaps even the emperor himself, was, was in harm's way. This was a disgrace that could not be allowed to go unchallenged. The ethos for the Romans is revenge, hatred, anger. There's no idea of compassion, uh, of overarching compassion for humanity. Uh, these are very, very ruthless people. Ordering Germanicus to Germany is one of Augustus's final acts. The next year, at age 77, he lies dying, broken by the consequences of Rome's defeat, his dream of empire unfulfilled. With no sons of his own, Augustus names Tiberius as his successor. Tiberius will take his place as emperor and try to win back honor for Rome and Augustus. Augustus had gloried in a whole series of successful military campaigns. He never recovered psychologically from this blow. He died a few years later. And this, uh, in many ways, seems to have destroyed what he felt was his legacy. Augustus, who devoted his life to Romanizing the world, dies of failure. What was lost in Germania can never be recaptured, but still the Germans must pay for this humiliation. <laughs> A bloody and humiliating defeat beyond the Rhine has brought glory to the Germanic chieftain Arminius and his barbarians, and has undermined Roman confidence. But Rome, is not finished yet. Roman General Germanicus marches to Germania in a mission of vengeance, attacking any tribe sympathetic to Arminius. In defiance, these tribes burn their own villages to deprive the Romans of anything useful. These northern barbarians, at least across the Rhine, didn't have big cities to plunder. They had increasingly growing settlements, but they could just fade away uh, and come to fight another day and leave you having spent a lot of money on a campaign that didn't return anything to you. So war was becoming a negative cash flow instead of a positive cash flow. First century historian Tacitus. Germanicus dispatched one of his generals to rout the Bracteri tribe as they were burning their possessions and amid the carnage and plunder, found the eagle of the 19th Legion, which had been lost with Varus. The troops were then marched to the furthest frontier of Bracteri, ravaging all the country in between. On their campaign, the Romans rescue Segestes, the rival chieftain imprisoned by Arminius. But the humiliation doesn't stop there. Most devastating, the Romans see Segestus' daughter, Thusnelda, now pregnant with Arminius' child. She was captured by the Romans and taken to the capital as proof of how successful the Romans had been at defeating uh, Arminius and making his life miserable, even though he had been the one who had destroyed Varus and his three legions. In 15 AD, six years after the ambush, the Roman army comes to the Calcresa Woods Massacre site, now a sacred Germanic monument to their victory. They found the actual site of Varus' defeat, at least the ultimate moment, because there were still broken weapons scattered around. There were skulls nailed to the trees. Oh, the scene was awful. Uh, it was virtually uh, a plain full of white bones, except for uh, most likely the officers who would have been, if they were captured, sacrificed by the Germans, who did practice human sacrifice by, you know, hanging or slitting the throat. First century historian Tacitus describes what the Romans encounter. In the field were whitening bones scattered where the men had fled and heaped in piles where they had stood. Lying nearby were broken weapons and limbs of horses, while the skulls of men were nailed to tree trunks. Not far away stood the barbarian altars, 
where they had sacrificed the tribunes or senior centurions. So the scene was pretty emotional, uh, certainly for Germanicus's men. Some realized that these could be relatives, these could be friends, these could be comrades in arms uh, that I'm burying. And burial of the dead in antiquity and doing rites by them is extremely important uh, to keep the dead in their place, to make sure they don't come back to haunt you. First century historian Tacitus. The Roman army buried the bones of the three legions no man knowing whether he laid to rest the remains of a stranger or a kinsman. But with anger rising against the enemy, all simultaneously mourned and hated. Symbolically, it was really important for Rome to show that it remembered its fallen veterans uh, and that it was never going to give up trying to reclaim the honor that had been taken from them by the incompetence and arrogance of their commander. To the Germans who see the killing field as a holy memorial, the burial is a desecration. As soon as the soldiers leave, the Germans exhume the Roman bones and re-sanctify the site of the massacre. Arminius, believing he had soundly defeated Rome six years ago, is livid that the Romans have come back and confounded by the sudden turn of events. Tacitus recounts his rage. Arminius, with his naturally furious temper, was driven to frenzy by the seizure of his wife and the foredooming to slavery of his unborn child. He flew into a rage, demanding war against Augustus, war against the empire. And war did come. Once again, Arminius's stealthy forces, familiar with the landscape, exploit their advantage over the unwieldy Roman troops. A legion is overwhelming where you can choose the battlefield flat and expansive room to maneuver in in tightly packed units this was none of those things it wasn't flat there was no room to maneuver and you couldn't even assemble your units in full strength but germanicus sets a trap luring the enemy into the open and then pouncing the Romans win the battle, but not the war. The incompatible fighting styles, the expense of the campaigns, and the tenacity of the Germanic barbarians rob Rome of any hope of lasting victory. There were several years of punitive raids by the Romans east of the Rhine, in which they actually tried to capture Arminius, they tried to defeat his people. These were not successful. Neither Arminius nor Germanicus will live long enough to see where their historic efforts would lead. Three years later, in 19 AD, both die unheroically. Germanicus succumbs to illness, though some say he is poisoned by a rival in the bitter political jungle Rome has become. That same year, Arminius is killed by his own people when he oversteps his authority. Arminius was really devoted to both German liberty and his own self-advancement. Arminius wanted to be the king of the Germanic barbarian tribes. They didn't want a king. They wanted autonomy, and Arminius had given them that, and in the process, changed the shape of Rome. We could think of this battle as being the battle that truly stopped Roman expansion at that point. Had the battle not happened, who knows how far eastward Rome might have conquered, through all of Germany, into Poland, possibly even eastward into Russia. We just don't know. After Teutoburg, Rome deems the risks of expansion too high, the benefits hardly worth it. But soon enough, the lure of foreign conquest becomes too seductive to ignore. Next on Rome, rise and fall of an empire. In 47 AD, Emperor Claudius leads a campaign to the edge of the known world, the mysterious island of Britain. But the inhabitants violently reject Rome's domination, drawing the empire into a savage guerrilla war. <laughs> 